Hey folks, my name is Mo Amir and this is Van Keller, British Columbia's bonafide culture and politics TV talk show. It's the holidays. Everything smells like gingerbread and every party is basically a speed run of how fast can my pancreas give up? So tonight we're talking about food and yeah, it's gonna be a bit of a bummer. According to a new report, 1.3 million British Columbians are experiencing food insecurity and food bank use is now unsustainable. But how is that possible in a country where we toss out millions of tons of food every year? And on that note, can we sue big grocers for throwing out perfectly good food while others don't have enough? But first, we all know that the ultra processed food and alcohol that surrounds us over the holidays isn't great for us, but it may be even worse than we thought. To break it down, we're joined by a clinical assistant professor at the UBC Faculty of Medicine and a family doctor, Dr. Melissa Lem. So Dr. Lem, thanks so much for being here tonight. Great to be here. Thanks for bringing me back. First things first, how do we define ultra processed food? What does that mean? This is a pretty recent term, Mo. So ultra processed foods only kind of hit the mainstream in the 1980s. And then there's a group of researchers in Brazil who coined the term about 15 years ago under this NOVA classification system. And essentially, the further a food is away from its recognizable original state, the more ultra processed it is. And so there are certain criteria. Is there a threshold where it becomes ultra processed? Yeah, it's a it's kind of complicated. So some of the markers of being ultra processed mean there are a lot of additives like mm. food coloring, emulsifiers, that sort of thing. Also, a lot of the components of it are made in an industrial way, not in a kitchen. So essentially, these are made in factories from components of food, not the original food. So they extract starches and proteins and different components to make these kind of laboratory grown right. foods that we eat. <laughs> and another aspect, too, is unfortunately, they are made to be moorish. They make us want to eat more and more, and they're highly palatable and also, also more shelf stable. So this just unfortunately encourages us to eat more and more calories and more artificial ingredients that are bad for our health. Okay, so I think if if we're going through the grocery store, we all know that like chips are bad, sugary sodas are bad. We know that ultra processed foods or at least our you know, general idea of them, they're not good for us. But apparently they're even worse than we thought, right? Yes. Well, if you think about it, if you think foods that are high in salt and sugar and saturated fat and additives, we probably think, okay, that's bad for our cardiovascular system, bad yeah. for our heart. But in fact, there was a recent series of three papers published in the Lancet Journal, which is one of the oldest, most reputable scientific journals in the world, that showed that, in fact, the health harms go far beyond just your cardiovascular system. There are risks to your gut microbiome, which can increase your risk of inflammatory bowel disease and even cancer. It can also increase your risk of depression, anxiety and dementia because of influences on wow. the gut and brain microbiome. Okay. I know. Higher risk of obesity, higher risk of, of diabetes, and also, um, also some reproductive harms can accumulate because of the different kind of hormone mimicking substances within these foods. And you probably, I guess when we're thinking about how much of these do we eat, how much of, of these are we actually exposed to, what percentage of our diet do you think comes from ultra processed food? I, I have no idea. No, how much do we eat? In the average adult, close to 50% in kids over over 50%. And in people, you were talking about lower income people in food Whoa. banks. Unfortunately, about 80% of people in lower income households of their food comes from ultra processed food. So it's a big public health issue. And like you just kind of went through, it sounds like it's affecting our whole body, our mental health as well, if you're linking it to things like depression. Like this is a systemic poison, it sounds like. That's right. You can think of ultra processed foods as almost like being the new smoking. In fact, wow. the World Health Organization classifies um, ultra processed meats. So these are like, you know, salami, pepperoni, that kind of thing as a group one carcinogen in the same group as tobacco and asbestos, believe it or not. What? So I know it's, it's kind of wow. crazy. And this actually worries me the most. So this category of, of cancer. So essentially, um, people who eat high amounts of ultra processed meat have higher rates of colon cancer. Women who eat high amounts in particular are more likely to have precancerous polyps one and a half times more likely before age 50. Now, my issue with this is that there's a lot of ultra processed foods that would meet that definition. But when you look at the, their macros or their nutritional details, it doesn't seem that bad. Like I'm thinking about, you know, the easy one is diet pop, right? It's zero calories. Uh, there's things like granola. There's things like flavored yogurt that I think fall under the ultra processed food label. Are those things as bad as their other ultra processed foods? 
This is one of the major criticisms other researchers have of this kind of categorization is it's a bit too broad and it's not very concise. And there are foods like, for example, whole grain breads, um, like fortified cereals, like milk substitutes, plant based milk substitutes that fall under this UPF Mm -hmm. category. But research tells us is either neutral or it can be positive for health. So that can be an issue. And if you're trying to figure it out, if you think something's healthy, Take a look at that ingredient list, look for added salt, sugar, look for all those weird chemical names that don't sound like actual foods, and then try to cut those sorts of foods out from your diet. And a way to try to to kind of mitigate the health impacts of ultra processed foods is think about fruits and vegetables. If say you're running low on time and you need to add something, add a fruit or vegetable to it. And then if you don't have enough money to afford fresh fruits or vegetables, you can use frozen or canned and avoid the salt and sugar. So there are ways to kind of mitigate the harms of UPFs if you have to eat them. This is all easier said than done, especially around the holidays, I feel like. But I also feel like you have some more bad news for me when it comes to alcohol. Obviously, we all like to enjoy a drink or two, especially around this time of year. Uh, We know that alcohol isn't particularly good for us, but you have worse news. Yes. So this comes from recent research looking at the overall health effects of alcohol. So we used to think it's called the French paradox, right? French people kind of have overall healthier um, lifestyles, and but they have higher amounts of saturated fat in their diet. Yeah. And people thought that's mitigated by the fact that they have red wine. Unfortunately, that research is not true. In fact, the new <laughs> research synthesis tells us that less is better than any amount of alcohol. So the new Canadian um, low-risk drinking guidelines recommend no more than two per week for okay. adults. Once you hit between three and six, you increase your risk of colon cancer and breast cancer. And once you're seven or more, it increases your risk of cardiovascular uh, disease. So, I mean, less is better than none. Thankfully, we see a a surge in non-alcoholic wines and beers. That Mm -hmm. that kind of part of the economy is booming more than the actual growth of alcohol. Oh, that's good. Okay. I feel like you've left me with just diet pop for Christmas. Like that's what I'll be drinking at this point. Bad news mode, diet pop is actually not good for you either. You just said, I know you just said, look at the <laughs> right. nutritional details. But look at what's on the side of diet pop. It has all kinds of chemicals in there and it actually makes you want, it gives you a sweet tooth because it's very, very sugary, yeah. the sugar substitute. So it makes you want to eat more. And in fact, there is research showing that people who drink diet pop compared to regular pop can have worse outcomes overall. <laughs> Do you have any quick tips for me this holiday season as, you know, I attend several different family get togethers and get togethers with friends? Yes. Non-alcoholic drinks. So bring your own. Again, there are lots and lots of those alternatives out there. So if you don't want to drink, bring your own and then go for the veggie, the veggie sticks, the fruit. Um, Go for it like regular cuts of meat, not processed if you want to eat that. Mm. Just the more recognizable the food is compared to its original state, the better it is for you. I love it. I mean, boring is sometimes best. Right? Yes, when it comes to food, boring and balance are best. Absolutely. Dr. Lem, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thanks, Mo. Folks, that was Dr. Melissa Lem. Follow her on Instagram and Blue Sky for smart, accessible health insights. Now, after some business, food bank demand in British Columbia is higher than ever, unsustainable according to the people who run them. And yet Canadians are wasting more food than ever before. So how does that make sense? We'll talk about it up next.